Welcome to everyone to this specific research Institute webinar. The title, as you know, is uh, I think a very pr provocative one, free speech, social media, fake news, dangerous speech and democracy, what should be done? I'm Chris Cox and I'll be moderating this discussion between the Honorable Dan Oliver and Bartlett Cleland. On behalf of all of us who are logged in, I wanna thank the Pacific Research Institute for hosting this webinar. It's one that I think we can all agree is gonna be stimulating uh, because it's a highly current topic. PRI regularly hosts webinars and podcasts on current issues like this one with experts from across the country to inform and educate and engage viewers and listeners like all of us. If you are interested in additional webinars and podcasts like this one, just check the PRI website at pacificresearch.org listings. I think you can all see our panelists, uh, our first panelist. And, and may I suggest also that uh, until it is your turn to speak, either as a questioner in the audience or uh, as a panelist participant, uh, uh, please uh, be on mute, which will make it easier for everyone. Uh, our first panelist is the Honorable Daniel Oliver, well known to many of us for his lengthy record of sterling accomplishments in public policy. He is currently chairman of the board of the Education and Research Institute and a director of the Pacific Research Institute. He's a former chairman of the Federal Trade Commission, a former general counsel of the US Department of Agriculture and also former general counsel of the Department of Education. In the 1970s, he was executive editor of William F. Buckley Jr.'s National Review and subsequently served as its chairman of the board. Our second panelist is equally distinguished, Bartlett Cleland, a Pacific Research Institute senior fellow in technology and innovation. He has spent his entire public policy career in the technology and innovation space, including working for many years on Capitol Hill. He's a veteran of many critical debates, including those involving encryption, supercomputer export controls, the Internet Tax Fairness Act, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, the Communications Decency Act, which will probably come up today, along with the 1996 Telecommunications Act, as well as efforts to increase transparency about congressional activities. I'll be serving as the moderator today. I'm a former member of Congress uh, who also worked uh, in the White House. Uh, and my experience as both a legislator and regulator has brought me into consistent contact with today's topics, including uh, the opportunity that I had back in the 1990s, along with my co-author, Ron Wyden, now a senator from Oregon, uh, to write uh, what is prosaically known these days as Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act. And while that's uh, certainly one of the big cogs in the machine that uh, is under examination in today's discussion, it's not the only one. Uh, so it's, it's delightful that we have the breadth of expertise that we have. And, and I'll be uh, sitting back a bit and, and just serving as the moderator because uh, we really do want to hear what our panelists have to say. Uh, just to set the scene uh, from my own perspective and, and to hit the mountain peaks of what this discussion is going to be all about. Uh, let's work through the topics raised by the title, free speech. I, I think we're all in favor of it, except when we disagree with it, except when we disagree with the substance of what it is that somebody is exercising their First Amendment rights to say that we don't like. Social media. It's ubiquitous, uh, it's constantly morphing. I think it represents the best of us and the worst of us. Fake news, well, we're all against that, uh, but we can't always agree on what fake news is. Dangerous speech, we're all against that too, but most of it is protected by the First Amendment regardless of what Congress might attempt to do. Democracy, well, we're all in favor of that, and we don't want dangerous speech or fake news to interfere. Though at the same time, uh, while preventing dangerous speech and fake news from interfering, we don't want to trample on free speech, which brings us back to our initial problem statement. I'll also note that 
social media as a term conjures for most of us the tech giants, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, Twitter, and so on. Most of the legislative initiatives that are aimed at amending Section 230, to which I pay particular attention, make no distinction between these large platforms and the over 200 million active websites available to anyone in the United States with a smartphone that are also all covered by Section 230. This much larger universe of websites could get caught in the crossfire with unintended consequences. Conversely, Congress is focused solely on the largest companies when it comes to antitrust concerns with big tech and Congress and regulators and legislators in Europe as well are accusing the leading platforms of a variety of anti-competitive practices. So with that as a scene setter, uh, let's dive into this topic or this array of topics. And uh, Dan, why don't you go first? All right, thank you, Chris. I should say before I begin that, uh, as I said earlier, that speaking about section 230 with Chris Cox in the, uh, in the audience is like talking about the Declaration of Independence with Thomas Jefferson in the audience. But we have to proceed anyway, uh, however daunting that cast may be. Well, free speech, social media, fake news, dangerous speech, and democracy, what should be done? That's a lot of topics to cover in five or seven minutes. Uh, instead of taking them individually, I will speak about what I think the real problem is. And in doing that, I think I'll probably cover all or most of the topics listed in the title. The reason we're having this discussion is that there's a general sense, at least among conservatives or the right or the non-woke or perhaps just Republicans, that the information necessary for a democracy to function properly isn't being made available in the public square. And the reason it's not being made available is that the megatech information companies, Amazon, Google, Facebook, and Twitter, don't want information detrimental to their points of view available to the public. Exhibit A for that assertion is the suppression of the Hunter Biden laptop story during the election campaign. There are other examples, of course, but this seems to be the most egregious because it was so directly tied to the election to the functioning of democracy. There is some polling that indicates that enough people who voted for Biden would not have voted for him if they'd known about the laptop that Biden would, would have lost the election. Now, even if that happens not to be true, it certainly might have been true, and that was certainly the intent of the people who suppressed that piece of news. If we can't agree that that's a problem, we're probably not gonna get very far here. So to sum up, or to tie all our topics together, I think we can say that the social media companies, Amazon, Google, Facebook, Twitter, and perhaps some others, because they limit speech that doesn't please them, are dangerous to democracy. Dangerous because democracy depends on the free flow of information, and they have routinely cut off that flow. Exhibit A, as I've said, is the Hunter Biden laptop story. Whether or not it, in fact, threw the election to Biden, it's enough that they tried. So, what should be done? The first point to understand is that nothing useful will be done in the next two to four years. The current system of censorship, which will almost certainly get worse, works to the advantage of the Democrats, who, as you may have noticed, control both houses of Congress and the presidency. They will not bite the hand that feeds them. The second point to make is that it takes Republicans a very long time to get organized to do anything. More than a decade after Obamacare was enacted, they still hadn't come up with an alternative. But that means we have no time to lose in designing a cure for what ails our democracy. Now, the free marketeers say, do nothing, let the market work. The problem with that is that the megatech companies didn't achieve their monopolies in a free market. The US government created a legal and, and regulatory environment that gave them a massive advantage over their non-tech competitors. Amazon got section 230, as well as tax-free internet sales, subsidized distribution for the post office, an exemption from liability for counterfeit and harmful products. For the other megatech companies, it was section 230. This problem we have wasn't created in a free market and a free market isn't gonna solve it. The people through their representatives will have to solve it. 
The question is how? I think there are several possibilities. One possibility is to repeal section 230. The point of section 230, as most of you probably know, was to encourage internet companies to allow people to post material on their systems without first vetting it themselves to make sure it was truthful or not illegal. There being no way the internet companies could possibly verify the content of the billions of postings on their sites. But section 230 also says that internet platform companies acting in good faith can censor anything they find obscene, lewd, lascivious, filthy, excessively violent, harassing, or otherwise objectionable, whether or not such material is constitutionally protected. But the megatech companies have driven a truck through that phrase or otherwise objectionable. For them, it seems speech that is conservative is objectionable. The problem with repealing Section 230 is that it would probably stifle the emergence of any new internet information company, which is why I think we should not repeal it. Another way to attempt to solve the problem is to amend Section 230. Senator Josh Hawley has proposed amending Section 230 by removing the immunity big, big tech companies have under it unless they submit to an external audit that proves that their content removal practices are politically neutral. My problem with that is with the people who get to do the audit. Would it be to take a random example, Merrick Garland, President Biden's nominee to be Attorney General. Garland has said during his confirmation hearing that he would prioritize combating extremist violence by which he meant he made clear the people who were at the Capitol on January 6th, but not he made clear the thousands of people who rioted all summer long and did billions of dollars worth of damage. What would Merrick Garland be likely to say about the suppression of the Hunter Biden laptop story? Another possible solution, which comes from Professor Richard Epstein, a libertarian, is to treat the big media companies as common carriers, which in a way is what I have proposed. Epstein says the common law rule is that no private monopoly has the right to turn away customers. It must take them all on a fair, reasonable, and non-discriminatory terms, a principle which sometimes goes by the acronym FRAND, F-R-A-N-D, fair, reasonable, and non-discriminatory, and that dates back to the 1600s. My solution is similar. I propose one, a fine on a megatech company that two, has been found guilty, three, in a trial by jury, of four viewpoint discrimination. I think that may be similar to Professor Epstein's proposal. It's just that I add a fine if the tech folks throw somebody off the train. Now it's true, jury trials can be dicey, but who would you rather have decide if there has been censorship of conservative views, or for that matter, of liberal views? 12 honest and true fellow citizens or Merrick Garland? I rest my case. The amount of the fine I propose would be attention getting, something like $50 million a day, starting say five days after the company's removal of the material was objected to by the plaintiff. We have to realize that a total fine of a mere say $2 million is beanbagged to these megatech companies and their owners. They probably spend that much on aftershave. That's why we need a $50 million fine for every day the infraction occurs. A fifth possible solution is to amend the antitrust laws to cover size alone, not as now, size combined with the attempt to monopolize. Something there is in Americans that doesn't like bigness, and these megatech companies are big. Each one should probably be broken up into, say, five smaller companies. Some people may say it would be perverse as a matter of public policy to encourage firms to run the race of competition only to turn around and penalize the winner. In general, that may be true, but perhaps not here where we are dealing with information essential to the proper functioning of democracy. If we broke up the big companies, then we would be able to let the market work and let competition ensure that all viewpoints had a forum problem solved. There might be some downsides, of course, 
but if the upsides were to preserve democracy, the downsides would seem to be with it. And now that I've solved the problem, Mr. Chairman, I think we should break for ice cream. <laughs> well, you certainly, uh, uh, to use a California metaphor, set the volleyball at the net here for Bartlett Cleland. So you're up, Bartlett. Thank you, Congressman. Thank you, Ambassador. Thank you, PRI. <laughs> Happy to be here and uh, proud to be here. Um, <clears throat> in in sum, um, I the, the ambassador and I agree on one thing: we should all break for ice cream. I couldn't name a better dessert uh, if you'd tried. Fantastic choice. Let me um, contend that there is a better approach, <clears throat> not only to a solution but into the analysis of the problem. One that uh, is probably more interesting to libertarian sure but one that should be equally, if not more, compelling and interesting to conservatives <clears throat> for any number of reasons. So the first challenge, I think, in addressing any kind of problem is to accurately and adequately define what that challenge is. I'll be a little bit glib, <clears throat> but from reading from the uh, conservative, so to speak, viewpoint on the problem, uh, you could largely uh, state it as uh, the GOP views, Republican views, conservative views are being restricted, uh, disfavored on social media, uh, not by necessarily other people on social media, but by the, the companies, some amorphous um, group of people acting to actively and systematically suppress points of view. <clears throat> so it turns out that facts matter. And I would say that uh, number one, Conservatives, at least in the branch that I grew up in, uh, were particularly proud, uh, which is Midwesterners, uh, particularly proud of being able to pin what they believe to the facts. There are any number of facts that get asserted, uh, or, or points that get asserted as facts that simply are not true. And I'll, I'll mention that as we go on through our discussion. I won't go through a whole list of those. I'll just highlight one uh, because it became so famous and, and so well known, and that was that the President of the United States was kicked off of social media. That absolutely is not true. What is true is that a person was kicked off social media for violating terms of service. That was a personal account, uh, was not the White House account, was not the POTUS account. And so that individual who happened to be occupying the White House, so in this case, President Trump, had other ways of communicating on the exact same platform in the exact same way if he went through the government channels, uh, that is to say through the White House channels, and to continue to be on social media. There are many more facts like that, that when you actually take a look at what's going on, the facts actually um, are not as they get reported. Number two, um, something that gives me great pause is the quick leap to in institute or insinuate government into a solution when there has not been um, even a prima facie case shown for where there has been a constitutional or even vaguely constitutional challenge. So the word gets bandied about a great deal um, that we, and, and what everyone thinks immediately when you say censorship is the First Amendment. In that case, censorship is a very specific problem, very specific issue. And it has everything to do with what the government is doing to you, not what private citizens are doing to you. And at the end of the day, that is what corporations are, private property, private citizens. They are not an apparatus of the government. And it's awfully dangerous when we start proposing that somehow government and uh, companies start acting and looking um, as one. I would actually say that many of the solutions proposed um, are going to bring greater harm to conservatives than the world to liberals at the end of the day. And Congressman, I can't recall if you had mentioned this, but if you have, I'll underscore it. And if not, um, I'll say it. But that is that uh, liberals, by and large, have a different problem online than do conservatives. Their proposed solution is not the conservative, generally speaking, proposed solution. Conservatives say there's too much involvement, there's too much interference. Liberals say there's not enough and there needs to be more. Both people, both sides have a lot of arguments but they are truly diametrically opposed. Uh, and I think what would happen is under a lot of solutions, conservatives would end up the ones who actually were getting more regulated uh, than the other side. 
There's a suggestion that uh, without regulation, without a Section 230, uh, with tweaking a Section 230, that somehow leaving uh, websites, leaving social media, leaving edge providers, whichever word you'd like to use here, because it's a lot bigger than the big four uh, folks that uh, companies that people say, that somehow everything would work out, that uh, there would be more accountability, et cetera. But remember, Section 230 was in fact a piece of, uh, a part of a bigger piece of legislation, but that particular piece was intended to instill a certain notion of uh, personal accountability and responsibility. And that is that the people accountable and responsible for their speech would actually be the people who were speaking, not the platform. But because of what was happening in the 90s and frankly, what would happen tomorrow if, if things change, if you take away some, in pardon me, some incentive for companies to get involved, you will end up with a just an absolute fire hose of extreme violence and pornography. That's what we saw, and that, that was the foundation of the debate, the Communications Decency Act, uh, particularly if you read Senator Exxon's uh, statement. Um, it, I, I was in the Senate at the time, so my views are kind of from that chamber, but um, it was all about cleaning up the internet. That's not what would happen without some kind of encouragement uh, for companies to act. Why? Because of liability, frankly. And that's what was happening before the passage of the law. Companies were getting sued, um, and were taken to court, um, and, and not winning because they were not, uh, they were being accused of not acting, not interjecting into the stream of communication. It wasn't what we say, you know, the conservatives say, that they were acting too much. It was that they weren't acting at all. So um, I want to hit the antitrust uh, point real quick on my way to talk about the uh, fairness doctrine, and that is the, the kind of antitrust uh, solution that was laid out here is actually one that these days is called hipster antitrust. It comes right from the uh, Louis Brandeis playbook, a very liberal uh, Supreme Court justice um, known for his liberal views, uh, his progressive views. And the notion uh, was that big simply, and I think we heard it here, that big is somehow bad w without any reasoning or justification behind that. That's what gave fire to the populism movement, uh, particularly prairie populists like William Jennings Bryan, another well-known progressive, uh, who pushed the same notion that somehow big was bad. Big and bad, big and antitrust violation don't necessarily go together. Uh, it's, it's not, uh, it's been disproven economically, it's been disproven with jurisprudence. Um, and so I think we need to be cautious before we start bringing out the perhaps largest weapon of the progressive movement to or anti-free market. So with the couple minutes, I think, yeah, two minutes I think I have left, I wanna go quickly uh, to what I see as the solution. The answer is allowing the market to operate. The investor has a good point. There have been any number of advantages given to some companies over time. However, section 230 isn't necessarily one of those. And why is that? The biggest the uh, proponent of that argument tends to be publishers, online publishers, so I think more traditional publishers, not um, who we think of today, uh, Facebook, et cetera. Those publishers have every opportunity to allow comments on their websites. See any of those lately? No, they took them down because they had the same challenge of trying to regulate those comments themselves. So the better answer then is to quash your opponents. That's where that argument comes from. This is about competition. It is about the free market. It's about the free market. It's about some of the free market trying to use the apparatus of government to gain an advantage, not to be put on an equal footing. The equal footing exists for anybody who's online. Uh, finally, I, I'll wrap up and, and leave some of this for the broader discussion, particularly around the, um, uh, the Josh Hawley proposal, for example. But on the Hunter Biden story, I actually wrote a piece on this. The, if the story was suppressed online, then we're still left to wonder how was the story suppressed not online? Because let's, let's face it, what we're talking here about today is online, Section 230, um, and antitrust breaking of big tech. Big tech doesn't run all the publishers in the country. Quite the contrary. It, they tend to be at odds with each other. The Hunter Biden story was brushed under the rug for much larger problems than anything like Section 230. It is about perhaps a viewpoint discrimination. But as best I know, that is completely legal in this country and completely legal under the US Constitution. The solution then are examples like Parler. Parler had its own problem with the way it was operating and abusing its contracts. 
But regardless, those are the kind of answers that we should be looking for as conservatives and as libertarians. Start in a, a new newspaper. Think of the dying industry, but that's what you want to do. Start one. Start a website where people go to collect their news and promote it. Start a new, start a new uh, uh, television show. Uh, get a program on satellite radio to talk about politics. There are any numbers of ways to get information and to get news. To focus everything down simply to what ed providers are doing really is um, kind of not a great market analysis. With that, Congressman, I'll stop here and uh, feed other comments throughout uh, our conversation. Well, I, I think you both did an excellent job of looking out two different perspectives. If we could construct a Venn diagram of your respective views, I, I think I saw some overlap, but I also uh, see points of, of just uh, diametric opposition. Uh, Dan, I, I think uh, your opening observation uh, when you turn to what is to be done is that for the next four years, the pendulum is likely to swing the other way toward legislative and regulatory pressure on platforms to do more content moderation. Uh, and as I uh, understood your statement of the problem, uh, that's not the direction you would like to see things go. So uh, what would you suggest uh, as an approach to the several legislative proposals right now uh, that are focused on pressuring platforms and not just platforms, but also uh, uh, cable carriers and, and satellite providers of television uh, to uh, silence uh, conservative voices. Well, I, as I said, I, I think that the discrimination, the current discrimination is against conservative views and and no legislation will likely get out of this Congress, or probably the next one, is likely to help conservatives. Um, I don't agree that that censorship uh, is only is only by government. I mean, the word doesn't indicate that. We may we may think that periodically, but A can censor B, and they can both be private parties. In this case, the private parties, uh, the big tech um, information companies, are censoring. Uh, conservative speech and the fact that it doesn't, the fact that it doesn't, uh, that it isn't done by government may mean it doesn't violate the First Amendment. There's some question about that, but it, but it doesn't mean it isn't censorship. So I think we should be able to agree that there is censorship. If we can't agree that there is censorship, then as I suggest with the channel, we really might as well go have some ice cream because we don't have enough commonality to, uh, to talk about. Um, it's clear that the big tech companies have, have censored. And the only question is whether, well, the two questions, one is whether you object to it. And the other is what can be done about it. Now, some people have said, Bart has said, said it to himself in, in a sense, I think that you can go and find some other method of speaking. You can go to Paula, but Paula has about, I've forgotten, you may know, 1% of the market, or maybe 2%, maybe it's 3%. I don't think it is that large. It was thrown off for a while, so it probably, if it had 3%, it's probably back down to 1%. So saying you can go and speak on Paula is like, is like it would be like the government saying, well, we're not gonna let you speak in, in the public square, but you can go stand in your shower and speak all you want. So we're not really censoring you. Well, yes, you really would be censoring us if you said we had to go, that we could only exercise our free speech, First Amendment rights in the shower stall. Um, we want to be able to speak in the public square. We talk about the public square because that's where the public is. That's where the public is listening. And the public is not listening to Paula, at least not today. The public is listening to Twitter and the other big companies. So I think that, that certainly nothing will be done for conservatives in the next two to four years. But I think we need to, we conservatives, the Republicans perhaps generally, need to think about what can be done to, to open up the marketplace, the, the public square, so that uh, everybody can, can get a chance to talk there. Chris, you said something in the beginning that I want to disagree with. It was a throwaway line, I'm sure. Um, uh, you said that we, you know, we like to censor speech, uh, except our own, but that of course isn't really true. I think we're all willing to have lots of speech. Most of us are willing to have, well, most of us were willing to have 
to let the other side speak as well. Um, and this, this uh, sensory of conservative speech is, I think, relatively new. Um, uh, on the internet, obviously, because the internet is relatively new, but we've been seeing it across the country on college campuses for a long time. And, and we, you know, we don't like it, we shouldn't like it, and we should try to do something to put a stop to it. Uh, but I think there's no point in denying it. Oh, you can take that call if you need to. I don't know where it's ringing from. <laughs> so I turned uh, everything off. You can't go, you can't get away from the buzzing. <laughs> yeah, so so I will uh, accept your emendation to my throwaway line because what I uh, imprecisely was aiming at was to describe where the country is uh, on these questions. Uh, and not any particular individual on this panel. I think uh, the three of us probably are in complete agreement that uh, more speech is generally the antidote to speech right. where we disagree rather than silencing voices with which we disagree. So, so taking that as a given, um, uh, let's think about uh, uh, one of the throwaway lines that, that, that uh, you just provided, Dan, and that is that uh, big tech is taking the otherwise objectionable coda uh, in section 230 and driving a truck through it. But I, I'd venture to say that's actually not the case. It is true that uh, there is a good deal of content moderation that is based on political predilection rather than the things that are listed in section 230. But uh, what, I, what I cannot find uh, is any mitigation and cases that have resulted in courts saying, yep, that otherwise objectionable thing covers any kind of political predilection so that if big tech says that they, they don't like low taxes and they want higher taxes, uh, they have a right under section 230 to stop people from saying they want lower taxes. The, right. the most recent case that I'm aware of that the Supreme Court just denied cert on uh, is uh, malware bites against Enigma software where the Ninth Circuit said that that otherwise objectionable is not infinitely elastic. So a lot of people are pinning on section 230, something that is a real problem to, to be sure, uh, but it's not, it's not the making of section 230. It is rather, Dan, as you said previously, uh, the First Amendment that, that the New York Times uses and everybody else uses to print only stuff that they agree with. Congressman, if I, if I can uh, jump on to that, and to respond a little bit to what Dan laid out, I think this is another case, frankly, where facts really are important. And um, it's, it's great to assert things we don't like. My um, mind's made up. My mind's made up. Don't confuse it to the facts. That, that's very good. That, that, well, and, and I think that's a, a, a great throwaway line that I'll tease you about. Um, but um, except don't change your mind on ice cream. Um, I don't think that there is any right that I know of uh, to guarantee a size of audience for anybody. Um, I don't think uh, when I uh, write a piece for PRI, for example, that uh, PRI is entitled to have some tens of thousands of people open that and read that piece. Or if I'm uh, Fox News, that I'm guaranteed uh, to have the most watched news. Or frankly, if I go to the public square, that I'm guaranteed the right to, to have as many people in that public square as possible. It's an interesting discussion about size of audience, but it's a completely irrelevant discussion from my point of view. And my point on censorship is, is simply this, using the word in the context of this debate often brings to mind government acting. Of course, people, I mean, we censor personally, right? So in a very broad uh, meaning of the word, of course, there's uh, uh, censorship of some, of some uh, point. And I would argue that most conservatives are probably highly supportive of that, or let me be specific. This person is highly supportive of that, especially with children in the past. I'm very excited to censor what they can watch on TV or what they can get online. And I am equally as excited when companies like a Facebook or a Twitter uh, limit it from just being a, a, a filth bilge of pornography and, and, uh, and violent pornography at that, especially since I have girls. Um, th there is no doubt that there is some censorship. So I think we need to think, be, be very exacting in what we're talking about and very fact-driven in what we want to have uh, happen. Finally, I'll say, this is all, um, I, I do that. You, you said no one can argue about whether there is actually some kind of discrimination, censorship going on. 
And I actually would argue that that, again, with the facts, uh, if you talk to any of these companies, if you read it all about the industry, virtually every company, and, and admittedly, I'm not, I don't know about perhaps smaller companies. I only talk about the, the big ones here. They all have a process. Um, and that process is you know, imperfect. And if we're looking for perfection, um, I would argue we will look in vain um, while we're here on this earth. But if you, are, if you are looking for a process that works, the process is roughly this. It's artificial intelligence, it's algorithms that knock out, I'm gonna botch the numbers, but I'm gonna say it's somewhere in the neighborhood of 95, 96%, 98% maybe, of the material that gets delisted is blatant pornography, is extremely violent videos, ex extremely violent, degradating pictures. I'm not talking about things that any decent human would look at. I'm not, this is not a margin call. Then there's everything else. That everything else makes it through and it goes by a human being. And that human being is, you know, often right, but sometimes is not. But then there's an appeals process. So people do not just get ejected permanently uh, for, for making a mistake. And in that appeals process, you are, you are able to, um, the, to state your case and to, to show in the terms of service where you didn't violate terms of service. And that's, and that's after it goes through internal reviews with managers and whatnot. So I would argue there is not a systemic censorship problem. So I, I kind of do reject the notion that there is some kind of systemic censorship going on other than what I've outlined. Mr. Chairman, I, I, if I may for a moment, um, uh, it may be then that the, <clears throat> that the topic of the debate um, has been, uh, uh, is erroneous and that we should have, we should have had two debates. The first debate should be whether or not there is viewpoint discrimination going on here. Um, uh, because if the other side denies it, then it seems to me that's the first case that has to be made. I grant you there's no point talking about a solution until you describe the problem. Amazon took down the film about uh, Justice Thomas, it was an amazing film, he's an amazing man, but the, Amazon didn't like that. So at the end of Black History Month, they took down an amazing film about Justice Clarence Thomas. Now, you can tell me that was done by some algorithm uh, in some dusty corner of North Dakota in a barn that somebody constructed. I don't believe that. I think somebody took it down because they didn't like the idea that people were showcasing the life of Justice Thomas, who, as you may or may not have heard, turns out to be a conservative. And there are thousands of those examples. I'm not aware of examples of their taking down uh, liberal points of view. So until we can agree that, um, that there has been essentially, essentially censorship of conservative viewpoints, um, we, we don't really have enough uh, common ground, I think, to have a discussion. So perhaps, perhaps to solve that problem, um, uh, my worthy opponent, could concede, at least for the next 20 minutes, that there has been rampant, egregious viewpoint discrimination against conservatives. Now, uh, uh, assuming that to be true, now what would you do? Well, if I may uh, uh, try and uh, find the golden mean here uh, between our two panelists, I think it's fair to infer from what already you have said that, that you both agree that there is a conservative and a progressive perspective on this problem and that those two perspectives are diametrically opposed. And given that that's, you know, while well, those are perspective, or pardon me, uh, subjective uh, perspectives from those quarters, I think it's an objective reality that that's what, uh, that's what we're facing. Uh, if I state the problem that way, can I get you guys on the same page? Sure, I, I actually think that uh, that's that's not the that's not the problem. Uh, I, I could easily have this debate whether there is or is not viewpoint discrimination, because I have I run into my next challenge for uh, to me for my conservative viewpoints, which are what about private property? I don't think that government should have a whole lot of authority just to barge into private property and tell people how they should run their companies. We might not like it. Listen, I could rattle off a whole list of companies that I don't like from personal interaction with them uh, to the way they treat customers, to the, the, the views they, that their CEOs and executives lay out in front of people every day um, in Forbes or Business Week or the New York Times or Wall Street Journal. I, I just don't, I, I tend not to shop at those uh, kind of places. So I can have the same discussion whether or not there is systemic conservative uh, viewpoint discrimination, which I don't, I frankly don't think there is. 
So the argument that proceeds from private property and free markets, uh, and here, Dan, I'm going to defer to your uh, much deeper personal knowledge of the uh, authority to which I am going to uh, turn, and that is William F. Buckley, uh, who, who made the same argument persistently, but always made an exception for antitrust. And since Dan, you used to be the FTC chairman and know a hell of a lot more about this subject than uh, others that we might ask, uh, I want you to respond to Dan's, uh, pardon me, I want you to respond to Bartlett's point, Dan, uh, uh, previously about uh, Justice Brandeis and, and then take us down the road through uh, Professor and then Judge Bork and the consumer welfare standard, which displaced uh, the, the earlier in the 20th century view and, and help me understand uh, your assertion that in each of their respective markets in a rigorous antitrust analysis, the platforms that we think of as big tech are actually legal monopolies under the consumer welfare. Well, because I, you know, the first hurdle it seems to me is that their products are free. So it's very difficult using a normal antitrust analysis to say that you know, their monopolies have given us higher prices or what have you. So the analysis has to be, I think, a little more sophisticated than that. Yes, I mean, it, so as you say, it, it, in one sense, it doesn't fit in the normal antitrust paradigm because the issue is not prices. Uh, in, the, in the early days of antitrust, um, uh, in the, in the post-early days of antitrust, there was a sense that um, bigness itself is bad. And the most famous case is the Bob's Grocery case decided in 1967, where two California supermarkets were going to uh, uh, merge. And the total, help me if I get it wrong, I think the total market share that they were going to have in the LA market was 7%. And Joseph Potter Stewart issued his famous line saying the only consistent theme you could find in the uh, cases brought by the Justice Department was that the Justice Department always won. Uh, and that was, I think, the high or the low watermark of antitrust. And then subsequently, Bob Bork came along, Justice Bork came along and wrote the antitrust paradox and basically changed the way antitrust was, uh, was seen. And he turned it into a consumer welfare statute and that bigness could obviously in many cases and perhaps, perhaps in most cases be um, pro-consumer in that the uh, various functions of the corporations um, the economies of scale could work toward the toward the benefit of consumer, but he had in mind really only only price and innovation, um, and he wrote the antitrust paradox back in 1978, which was closer to the heyday of radio than to the internet age, and and now we find ourselves many years later, 40 whatever it is, um, 40 some years later. Uh, and it's, I don't think we should mock ourselves into uh, Judge Bork's thinking because I think we should um, give him the uh, credibility it might have changed his thinking. In the case of the big tech companies, uh, they are doing something that, that may be inimical to something that is more important than, than low prices and innovation. And I think that's the point. And he trusts his design, essentially to work on consumer welfare but in, but in terms of prices and innovation, uh, and what the tech companies are doing is, is a damaging democracy itself. So I don't think that Judge Bork would necessarily propose um, any kind of law that sought to reinvigorate democracy, even at the expense of, uh, of curtailing the power of big corporations. And it's all very well to have the free market view, um, but we, we, we impose lots of restrictions on, on companies, on economic, uh, operations and certainly, certainly a, a restriction that was designed to further democracy itself would seem to me to be uh, the most reasonable kind of restriction you could possibly come up with. Arla, do you want to respond? Yeah, I kind of want to pick on that my last line, which I find to be uh, chilling, honestly. So um, I'll, I'll pick the proposal, um, although this might have been, I tried to take notes, it might be intertwined with uh, Senator Hawley's proposal. But the, um, as I understand it, 
at the end of the day, government is the backstop or the certifier, I think in the Holly case, and in the other case, it would be a, a jury, is the, the ultimate backing and certification of whether uh, a company um, is being not political. That is to say, whether a company has spoken correctly or acted correctly. And I find that to be um, chilling. So when we talk about actual threat to democracy itself, I would say that proposal is, it goes right to the heart of, I think, of virtually everything in the Bill of Rights um, and certainly goes to, to a First Amendment standpoint. I, I don't think it would withstand constitutional muster, but listen, I'm just a lawyer, I'm not a judge. Um, but much, I think worse than that, worse than whether it's constitutional or not, because I think that, you know, lawyers by definition patrol what is the least acceptable, right? And I would like to think that we'd be doing what is higher than that, as individuals, as companies, and as legislators and regulators. I would like to think that we wouldn't immediately uh, go to where the government becomes the, the, the uh, certifier of what is appropriate speech. That completely turns our history, completely turns the Federalist Papers, completely turns the writing of, writings of any number of conservative justices, and completely turns the First Amendment itself on its head in a horrible fashion. And so I, I which I find to be, um, I'm certainly it's anti market, but it's, it's completely anti conservative and certainly anti libertarian. Finally, on the market piece, um, I, I'm not sure that I uh, find persuasive an argument that says, but we do lots of regulations on the market already. So what's one more? That actually strikes me as um, even, even as recently as the Trump administration, and I don't remember the catchy phrase he had or his administration had, but essentially it was for every new regulation, we're going to uproot two more. It is that, that thinking is opposite of that. That thinking is a very progressive approach of how do we instill more government doing more things. So I, I think all around the, the real threat, I, uh, I wrote this in my notes earlier, is that all of the proposed solutions strike me as being much worse than the purported harm. I, I could grant and stipulate that there's some amount of harm and I think still the other side bears a, a huge onus on proving that their solution is not worse than that harm. Well, if I may, uh, Mr. Chairman, um, I said in my opening remarks that I'm skeptical of Senator Hawley's proposal because it, it allows government to make the decision. And as, as I said, if it's gonna be Merrick Garland making that decision, we'll not be better off than we are today. <clears throat> Which is why my suggestion was to take it to a jury and let 12 men and women, honest and true, make the decision. We're better yeah. off there than we are uh, having government do it, in my opinion. That's still um, government. Some, that's still government. No, 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 it's not. I don't think that's quite right. Um, at, at any rate, we, uh, if, you, if, you, if you deny the problem, if you don't think there's a problem, then we can't get to a solution. But it seems to me the Hunter Biden laptop story, let's assume that it's through the election to Biden. If you don't find anything wrong with that, then we don't have enough common ground really to have this discussion. I would just ask that, how do you know about the Hunter Biden laptop story? What? How do you, I would just ask this. You, you, you keep asserting that no one knows about the Hunter Biden laptop story. I, I, I'm willing to bet, I think we have 84 people on here. I bet 80 of them know the story. How do you and they know the Hunter Biden laptop story? But the polls indicate that something like 35, 40% of the people have never heard of it. So that's a polling, polling can be wrong, of course, but the polls indicate that a, a huge number of Americans had in fact never heard of it. The people who are likely to be signed on to this webinar of people interested in public policy with the time uh, to spend whatever their time zone is. Most people are probably at, at work. Um, and as I say, the polls indicate that they've not heard of it. So I think it's fair to say that, that it, it is at least possible, plausible, that the Hunter Biden laptop story threw the election to Biden. And, and, and we ought to proceed, I think, at least, on the, at least hypothetically on the assumption that it did. And if it did, then what do you say about what we should do? I'd say, I think the last time I looked at the numbers, 60, only 60% of the people knew who the Vice President of the United States was. So if the number is 40% of people who didn't know, um, I'm going to blame the education system. I don't know. But, but, but they vote anyway. An alert, uh, now that the debate's just getting warmed up and, and we're getting some real action, I, I note we need to look at the clock and uh, see if we can turn to some of the questions from our our audience and we will have to 
I'll be brief about that, for which I apologize. But things have moved very swiftly here. And as I said, we were going to go for flow, and we did. So uh, uh, the first question uh, is to you, Dan. And I, I selected it out of uh, a half dozen because it's directly germane to what you were just discussing. So I won't feel as if I'm cutting this discussion off. The question is, could you clarify your idea of how litigation over content moderation uh, will not produce a chilling effect on platforms that rely on user created content. Uh, how will uh, proposing that complaints about content require relatively instant response from platforms uh, not give rise to the problem of the heckler's veto about which the Supreme Court has consistently expressed concerns about? I, I don't think I understand the question, but I, I my answer would be, this, would be the same anyway that um, I think viewpoint discrimination, discriminating against a um, particular viewpoint is, is something different. And maybe like, again, to quote Justice Potter Stewart, uh, I know it when I see it. Um, and I, it's, it's, it's not a problem that most people run into uh, in normal circumstances, but is a problem when you get into the political marketplace where people gather in the, in the public square to hear political views. Those are the views that get uh, snuffed out by uh, the liberal high-tech companies. And, and we should feel this way if it were conservative high-tech companies snuffing out liberal uh, views. We should, we should all be against it because um, when the wheel turns, um, the shoe may be on the other foot if you'd like to combine your metaphors. Um, so uh, it, it seems to me that as I say, the first thing we have to do is, is agree that there's a, that there's a problem. Um, and I don't think we've done that yet. All right, and this uh, next question could actually go to either one of you. I'm gonna flip it first to Bartlett, uh, just to alternate. Uh, this is from Alex. I completely agree that uh, not the company, by which I think he means the platform, but the ones who speak should be responsible. Does this mean that there should be a law which prohibits companies to censor, but which keeps people responsible for what they say? So, uh, interesting. I, um, let's see, should there be a law that says companies should censor? Is that the question? Uh, that comp companies should not censor. Should not censor. Okay, so that they're, they're mandated by government to be neutral uh, platforms. Um, no, I, I think the easy answer is no. Um, I think that the, um, uh, the right answer is those who are speaking and those who speak erroneously or those who, um, in, you know, whatever, whatever they're doing that is uh, falsifying uh, fraud, et cetera, that they should be the ones held accountable for that speech, not the platform. And I don't think that there is um, any evidence that the government has some mandate here to step into the private sector with some new heavy-handed regulations. I just have not seen the case made. And here, here's, the way I, here's the way I put it to sum up. Um, I, I think a large portion of the Section 230 debate, and I think the debate that's happening right now, which is more or less about Section 230, but some of the same kind of tensions, uh, comes down to this. Uh, the time then and the time now has come for people to decide what they really believe. Uh, should they regulate the internet via government, tame in the way that politicians find pleasing, or in or in, the, in this case, in the way that a law written that it will be then that, that will be fulfilled by a jury and still government action, the, the way that those people find pleasing, or do you allow the chaos and creativity of innovation and to some extent, yes, the ugly side of a citizen's voice to continue. And Chris, you mentioned that at the beginning. Policymakers had to choose then, they need to choose now, whether accountability is better than trial lawyer liability, because that's where this will go. No question. And whether encouraging good faith, which is what Section 230 does, is better than forcing compliance with one size fits absolutely nobody, heavy handed progressive regulations. That's the bottom line. And that's the filter I come through. And that's why I said I don't need to agree or disagree whether there's a problem with the way some of these companies are acting, because that essentially sums up my approach. I was proudly on the side that said these companies should be allowed to continue operating and individuals should take accountability for their actions. Yeah, and I think if you respond to this question also, uh, it'll give you an opportunity to further uh, explain what you think the solution is. Well, 
um, I don't think Bartlett would he'd like to repeal all the antitrust laws then. Um, and uh, because they do the same thing in their own way. And there was a time said the Ukraine antitrust was uh, handled so badly that um, that was a persuasive argument. But um, post Judge Bork, uh, antitrust became quite sensible. But, but it's still, it's government interference in the marketplace, if you like, because the government, the people deciding, uh, uh, making their own decisions, uh, decided that they didn't want a company uh, that was big enough to uh, stifle the economy and raise prices. So the government said, okay, well, when you get to be that big and when you, uh, when you buy up every other competitor, which may be what the tech companies have done, uh, the Department of Justice is suing Google as we sit here, um, then you basically interfered with the free market in a way that, that we don't like. Um, that part we say, well, why shouldn't they buy up everybody and double the prices for everything? Um, you know, make baby formula cost a thousand dollars a bottle if people have that money to pay it. Well, people decided that they didn't want that kind of free market uh, uh, activity going on. So they passed antitrust laws and in due course, they, they refined them so that they were only against huge companies buying up the competition in order to raise price or stifle innovation. And you may say that's not good free market policy and it may not be 100% laissez-faire free market policy, but it, it works in a way that produces a better economy for most people. And I think most people agree with that. All I'm saying is that I think we need to, need to take, a, take a step in that direction. And I think um, uh, uh, the, common, the common carrier theory is essentially a good one. If you have the only, the only railroad track going from the East Coast to the West Coast, you can't tell people they can't get on that train. If you do, the government's gonna get after you and say, you're a common carrier. You have to carry everybody. If you don't, we'll find you. I don't consider that uh, uh, just, you know, despoiling the free market. I think that's perfectly sensible regulation. We've had that regulation in this country for, I don't know, well over a hundred years. And in a sense, that's what I'm proposing with these, with these big tech companies, they're common carriers. And if they don't, if they throw people off the train, we will find them. And I think that still allows the market to work. It just means that you can't um, do things that are inimical to the public and especially to the public as it exercises its democratic imperative. If, we I, have, can, if I can put my own words uh, in my own mouth. Gentlemen, uh, gentlemen uh, we've reached the top of the hour. So uh, I'm going to pull the drawstrings together on this conversation. I think we have time for one last audience question. Uh, you both had a chance to respond to that last one so much as I'd like to continue. This is somewhat related. So, so let's continue this man and take the last question from Eric. Uh, and he directs his question to uh, uh, Daniel Oliver, but uh, I want you both to respond to it. Dan, why don't you take uh, first swing? Question, do you think major newspapers of record should also be forbidden from engaging in viewpoint discrimination on political issues? They reach a uniquely large audience have a significant impact, much like major social media platforms? Uh, for me, no, because they're, they're simply not that large. Media, uh, newspapers just don't have the reach that, um, that the internet has. And in, in most cases, um, in the case of newspapers, there is radio and there is the internet and there are lots of other ways, magazines that people can, can get their news from in a, in a, in a smaller geographical area as most newspapers reach. So I don't think the situation is at all analogous. So, so that one's kind of easy for me because uh, it turns out that most of the news that is you get on social media comes directly from those exact entities. And so you're a little bit double counting or not counting large enough. Um, but then I wanted to say real quickly, uh, you, you're, the words you put in my mouth about antitrust were, were completely wrong. Um, and I agree. Companies should be able to buy up other companies. Then you did something very slick. And that is you said, oh, but then what if, what if they then raise prices and they deny uh, formula, et cetera, et cetera. Aha, uh -huh. now we have some consumer harm to look at. That might be something to consider, but not just simply because they're big. Big is not, that's a, I just find zero credibility. And that wasn't Bork, that's Justice Brandeis. That's a liberal argument. Bork actually pushed back on that notion. So that, that, that's, that's where I'm, I, did, I never said that I am 
whole hog okay with just buying up and then raising prices and harming people. In fact, just the opposite. But that's what the big tech companies have done. They've, they, they've gotten big and now they can suppress viewpoints they don't like. That's the same thing, if you like, of raising prices. It's, 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 it's the 21st century version of raising prices. And as antitrust uh, did something about raising prices in the 19th, in the 20th century, in the 19th century, so I think you should do something. We should do something about people who throw, throw the viewpoints they don't like off the train. Then Fox News should be regulated similarly, and I'm opposed to that as well. Well, all right, I think we've, we've uh, done a spectacular job of covering many different points of view, many different aspects of this issue uh, in the space of one hour approximately. Uh, I wanna thank you very, very much for uh, putting your heart and soul and, and all of your creative and intellectual energies into this. It went, uh, I think, uh, very entertainingly uh, in addition to anything else uh, for all of our participants online. I want to thank PRI once again for hosting it uh, and uh, for all who might have logged in that are new to the Pacific Research Institute. This is the sort of thing that uh, PRI routinely does that you can take advantage of. Uh, and there is absolutely no consumer harm in the process because the price is free. <laughs> Thanks very much uh, and hope to see you all in person one of these days when COVID abates. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Thank you, Congressman. All right. Bye now.